crowned with everlasting joy. That's what Isaiah the prophet promises us. And truly, that is the theme of this day, the joy of the Lord. And yet that joy is not only something that comes in the end at heaven, it begins here. Which is why the church does this in Advent and Lent, the two penitential seasons, that just over halfway through each one, we break from that purple to use the rose vestments to brighten up the decor and the music and emphasize joy. Today is Gaudete Sunday, which means we ought to rejoice. The challenge is, however, that we often do not understand what joy is. It's not quite excitement or comfort or pleasure. It's not quite an emotion. Perhaps the most striking feature of joy is that it pops up in places where by earthly standards, it doesn't make sense. Suffering, pain, difficulty, grief, and loss, and yet there can be joy. Indeed, one of the most joyful days of my life was just a few months ago, and what made that day joyful was the funeral of my grandfather. There were tears and weeping and grief, moments of realizing he's really gone, but there was also joy, a mixture of conviction and a sense of something more than this world and this pain. And it wasn't like I decided it would be joyful. The funeral looked like most others in terms of music and style, somber and serious moments. Indeed, some other serious funerals have caused that same experience in me. Because beneath all of that was this abiding sense of rightness. Something fitting, because it wasn't the final word. Death is sad, but met with faith. It is one of the places most likely to reveal Christian joy. And this tells us something important about joy. Jesus says, blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. And that word blessed could also be translated happy. Which, this is a strange line for Jesus to say right after he's listed all these great miracles he's been doing. The blind seeing, the lame walking, lepers cleansed, the deaf hearing, the dead rising to life again. Who would be offended by that? Why would he say this? Well, evidently, almost everyone would be offended. Because the miracles were not the final word. They were signs to us of the final word. When paired with the rest of his teaching, people began to realize is that these momentary flashes of excitement and victory were preludes to that other teaching of Jesus Christ, the cross. Yes, Jesus can overcome death and disease. What makes that offensive is that he doesn't always do it here. In fact, he goes on to teach that his goal is to die. When a mere mortal speaks of embracing death, it's easier to accept, since there's not really a choice. But Jesus is no mere mortal. He does have the choice to live or die, and he chooses to die. Why? Because the death he speaks of, death to self, bodily death, temporary death, lays the foundation for lasting joy to everlasting life. This is why on the Sunday literally named after joy, we get readings that talk about judgment, hardship and patience, and the imprisonment of John the Baptist. John may be the greatest born of woman, but Jesus, the miracle worker, doesn't even suggest the possibility that John will get out of prison. All of that greatness destined to end with death. And that's precisely why we should be joyful. Because that's the way to the kingdom of heaven, where even the least are greater than John the Baptist. My grandfather was a good man. 
but there will be no canonization for him. No one will call him a saint. Yet in the readings, prayers, and rituals of the funeral, in the stories of his often faulty but genuine attempts to love, in the fruitfulness seen in a large family that can spend an entire day together sharing those memories, there is an echo, a tangible experience of what he will be in the kingdom, what we hope ourselves to be in the kingdom. So what is joy? It is the experience of seeing clearly the outlines of eternal goodness. And in this life, it is often that dark backdrop of evil and death that makes those bright lines shine out all the more clearly. For all of his severity, John the Baptist is a prophet of joy because he proclaims to us in his life and in his death that love itself entered into this dark world to draw those bright lines of hope for us. What then does that mean for us? That we are called to be prophets of joy. And St. James the Apostle and John the Baptist show us how. Be patient, make your hearts firm, James writes. Pointing to the example of farmers waiting for their crops, something we're familiar with. James indicates that a major part of our calling as prophets of joy, is simply to wait well. There is an art to this. It's not merely forgetting about it until it happens later, and neither is it anxiously turning it over and over again in your mind while you wait. Patience and firmness of heart is a kind of contemplative watching, a contented anticipation. A farmer will often look at his crop, a gardener at his garden, not just to see what needs to be done, but to simply gaze upon it, allow himself some time to think about what it will be. Look upon Christ, contemplate him, spend time with what Christmas will look like. The change from Advent to Christmas is not just arbitrary. There is a real spiritual shift if you're paying attention to it, take time to ponder what that might be. Share that moment in a good meal with others, a fine drink, an evening of merriment. It is, after all, a day of joy today. Do not complain about one another, James tells us. The fact that God became man means that man has a profound dignity. To open ourselves to the joy of Christmas and eternal life requires us to open ourselves to the goodness of human beings despite their limits and failures and sins. Justice and correction have their place, but wallowing in complaints only steals joy from us. If you have someone to complain about, you have someone to pray for. Finally, embrace reality. The genius of John the Baptist is neither an optimism or a penitential pessimism. What it is, is wholehearted acceptance of the fact of a fallen world and wholehearted acceptance that God has a plan for its redemption. The kind of joy that manifests itself in the midst of penance, that rises up through grief, that breaks out in great suffering, that joy comes from accepting that we are suffering, but not accepting that suffering is all there is. It is not bland optimism or looking on the bright side. It is honesty about the darkness and honesty that the light is more. John's life ends in prison and with an unjust execution, but it is full of joy. Why? Because he knew the one who is to come, and that he had come, and he knew that all who believe, and that he himself would soon be crowned. 
crowned not with temporary relief or fleeting emotion, but when the darkness gives way at last, crowned with everlasting joy. And if you're open to it, that joy has already begun.